Now, my next guest this morning is an award-winning singer, songwriter and music producer. Born in Scotland, he was lead singer with Ultravox and co-writer of the second biggest selling single in UK chart history, Do They Know It's Christmas? He's going to be performing next Sunday at the Forever Young Festival in Palmerston House Estate in Nace. And he joins me now. Midjour, good morning to you. I know you've had an incredible career in the music industry, which still continues to this day. But can you take us back a little? You were born in Scotland. Tell me a little of what life was like for you growing up in Glasgow. Of course, yeah, a working class background. I was born in a in a tenement slum on the outskirts of Glasgow, a one bedroom uh, flat, uh, no heating, you know, all of that stuff. My father was a van driver, my older brother and younger sister and parents all stayed in this one little place. And we had a, a thing called a cavity bed, which I, I'm not sure you had in Ireland, no. you probably did. A cavity bed was like a hole in the wall uh, in the sitting room, uh, which the sitting room had a sink in it, so it was kind of everything. And these cavity beds were where your parents would sleep, so it had a mattress in there and it would have either wooden shutters or uh, a curtain. Uh, so we all kind of lived there till I was 10 and I plagued my poor parents. I used to be able to draw a guitar long before I could play one. <laughs> and, uh, and I plagued my poor parents to get me a guitar and they bought me a second-hand guitar when I was 10 years old, which cost half my dad's wages. So it was fairly basic, uh, but a good, a good upbringing. That's pretty amazing, isn't it, Midge? Because I had read that, that your dad spent half his weekly wage at that time to buy you that first guitar. I assume you're eternally grateful for that. Oh, I, I still have the guitar. Oh. I still have it. It's one, it's one of the, the objects, you know, when they, you mm. know, when you get asked questions about if your house caught fire tomorrow, what would you grab? Mm. So, well, once I grabbed the family, um, I'd grab that guitar because it's the one that's, that means uh, so much uh, to me. So, yeah, I mean, it was a major commitment. It was, you know, my dad was on six pounds a week, I think. So it was three pounds to buy this, this secondhand old dance band guitar. And it was actually a really good guitar because I think the problem that most parents have when they when they buy their kids a, a first guitar is they buy the cheapest one they can get and they're usually dreadful to play and they hurt your fingers and you never end up learning it. Well, I this was actually quite a good one. So I ended up t teaching myself how to get my way around this thing. Do you think your dad and your mum would have spotted that you actually did have some musical ability? Was there any music in your family or do you think he just bought you a good one because he was such a good man? I think it's because it's the only one that was there. Right? It was some this cousin or whatever who was who was selling this guitar or selling it on behalf of a friend. So it was the I don't think, they didn't know anything about guitars. Um, my dad vamped at the piano at my grandmother's house on his his side, and he, and he used to try and pick out tunes very Les Dawson-ish on the <laughs> piano, more wrong notes than right ones. But I remember they could both sing. They both sang to me when we were kids uh, and I remember him singing to my younger sister uh, so there was a musical flair through the family but nothing that you would actually see they and I think they succumbed to the guitar thing because I not only plagued them about it but I could sing and it didn't cost anything to sing so they could hear me singing all the time and they knew that I was passionate about music so I think that's why they gave in. Glasgow, of course, it's a great city. It reminds many people of Dublin, actually, if you live in Dublin, but it's a city really divided. Certainly back then when you were young, mid between Catholics and Protestants, even in terms of football, did that divide impact on you and your family at all? It kind of divided me between music and football, <laughs> I have to say, <laughs> because, uh, you know, you're quite right. Uh, you know, people, people could probably tell uh, which religion you were by your name. <laughs> You know, and certainly by which football team you supported. So I ended up not supporting any football team. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my dad was a Mad Rangers fan, so that instantly tags me as Protestant. But when um, when when my kids were born, I I never had them christened. I vowed that I would break that kind of that mm -hmm. divide at, at my point. So if they whatever they decide they want to be, if they want to be anything, they can go and do that. That's absolutely fine. But I wasn't going to pass that down the line because I'd seen so much of the trouble as, you know, as, mm -hmm. uh, as certainly, certainly people in Northern Ireland did. Uh, so I, it kind of put me off uh, that side of things completely. So I've left the decision to them. And at this moment in time, I don't know what they are, uh, which is probably <laughs> quite a good thing. 
Absolutely a very good thing. Um, you weren't always set, sure you weren't made in becoming a musician. What had you decided to pursue at first? Well, my dad, my dad being a van driver, I mean, when he came back from the war, he used to drive tank transporters or whatever it was, and, and he had no discernible skills. So he instilled in us that we should, you know, should get a trade, you know, mm -hmm. be a mechanic or an engineer or an electrician or a plumber or something, because that was quite a few steps up the the, the, the ladder uh, from, from where he was. Uh, and that meant you would, you know, you'd earn a decent living and you could, you know, keep a family and, you know, do overtime on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturday mornings and, and yeah, yeah, all of that. Mm. And it was a job for life, which it transpired wasn't a job for life. It's, it, I don't think they exist anymore. Um, but all the way through doing this um, engineering apprenticeship, my, my older brother was an engineer at the uh, Rolls Royce and I, I got a, an engineering apprenticeship. But I was playing in bands at weekends. So, um, so <laughs> by the time I got to 18, which is only halfway through the apprenticeship, I was given the offer of joining a full-time, fairly well-known band in Scotland. And I left that decision to my parents. And my father, I could see cringing in the corner, thinking, oh, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> and my mother, who ruled the roost, uh, just said, follow your heart. And that was it. I was off. <laughs> Wasn't that so great she did that? Amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing. I mean, these, you know, this, this was the job mm -hmm. that they had hoped, that I, you know, all the lives that I'd be able to get because it set me off on the right path. And here's me, you know, walking away from it to go and strap my guitar on. It must have been petrifying for them. You were born Jim, Yor, weren't you? How did you become Midge, Yor? Oh, it's easy. Um, James, uh, abbreviated to Jim, because everyone in Scotland says, hey, Jim, Jim, <laughs> everybody's called Jim. And when I joined this band at 18, it was uh, it was run by two brothers, the McGinley brothers, and uh, one of them was Jim, and he was older, and it was his band. <laughs> and he said, well, we can't have two Jims, so you're now Midge, which is Jim reversed, uh, M-I-J, and we just changed the spelling. You got a taste of success, didn't you, though, really early on? Because you had a number one hit with that first band, Slick, didn't you? I did, yeah. It was, um, it was a band called Slick, and uh, it, was, it was done by the same guys who did the Bay City Rollers, you know, Bill Martin and Phil Coulter, fellow Irishman. And, um, and it, they were almost interchangeable, those tracks. Uh, we, we turned up uh, in London to come and make a first record with all our equipment and a great big truck. Uh, we just driven down from Glasgow to come all excited about making our first record. And we walked into the studio and they'd already recorded it with the session guys. Because that's how they did things in those days. And it was soul destroying to say the least. So when the record got to number one and we got the phone call, it kind of did nothing for us. It just, it was like, it was someone else's achievement. It was nothing to do with us at all. And I think maybe that's what gave me the, um, the tenacity to go back out there and try again to get my 15 minutes, you know, the 15 minutes mm. that Andy Warhol kept talking about, you know, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. And I didn't feel as though it was my 15 minutes that I had. So, uh, so yeah, it was a, it was a, a bittersweet experience. That's so interesting that that's the way they did it. Like they did it with these session singers. And, yeah, and I, think yeah. a, I think a lot of the bands, a lot of the, certainly the boy bands who were going around at the time, you know, could probably play a bit, but maybe not well enough in the studio. Mm -hmm. And back then it was all about how much it cost to make the record. A bunch of session guys could do it in the morning and a band might take two or three days to, to get used to being in the studio and, and get the right feel and all of that stuff. So I, I totally understand why they did it. But, um, but you know, I think, they, I think the fact that, you know, I've been on and done a few other things since then, <laughs> I've proved them slightly wrong. <laughs> Just a few. So that was slick. Isn't it true you got approached also to join the Sex Pistols at one stage? I did, yeah. Uh, really weird, I mean, I have to say. Uh, uh, and it was nothing to do with my playing ability or, or being a musician. I, I was stopped in the streets of Glasgow outside a music shop, coming out of a music shop. And uh, my management at the time uh, owned the Glasgow Apollo. And when bands used to come uh, to play in Glasgow, uh, if they had a problem with some of their equipment, they couldn't just phone up uh, you know, an equipment rental place and, and rent something in. They didn't exist. So if there was a problem, they used to send 
various artists and crews round to the music shop and say, Midge, you'll be there. He's, he looks like this. Uh, you know, ask him. He's got an amplifier, a guitar, a keyboard. So he'll lend you the thing and get you through. And when I was stopped coming out the street by this English guy, I naturally presumed that this was what was happening. Mm. Uh, so he said, well, you speak to my friend round the corner. And and this guy who stopped me was, um, was a guy called Bernie Rhodes, who went on to manage The Clash. And his friend round the corner was Malcolm McLaren, uh, which was a, an interesting sight to see in Glasgow <laughs> in 1975. And, uh, and he proceeded to tell me about the bands that he had managed and, uh, and the shop that he ran with Vivian Westwood and fashion and clothes and the New York dolls and all of this stuff. And he said, I'm putting a band together. Would you join? And I said, well, you haven't even asked what I do. So no. <laughs> Um, no, and the band, of course, was the Pistols. Uh, and what, what happened was they found themselves in Glasgow because they had a, a beaten up old car with a bit, a, a bit of a very hot uh, music equipment in the boot. And, uh, and they'd been driving all the way from London to Birmingham and Manchester and Leeds and you know Newcastle mm. and found themselves in Glasgow trying to sell this equipment. So I didn't join the Pistols, but I bought an amplifier. <laughs> <laughs> And then the amazing thing is when you did join Ultravox, weren't they effectively falling apart, Midge? Um, you joined them as lead singer. So what was it that drew you to them? Well, I, I weirdly, just just before that, just prior to that, although I didn't join the Sex Pistols, I ended up joining a band with the original bass player of the Sex Pistols, Glenn Matlock. I moved from Glasgow to London to join the Rich Kids. And during the, 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 the year or so I was with the Rich Kids, I bought a synthesizer and introduced it to the band in 1978 with a view to incorporating it into a rock, you know, mm. s situation, just like I did with, with, uh, when I joined Ultravox. And of course, it split the band up. I, I formed Visage to, uh, to fulfill that idea of electronics and, you know, modern dance music and whatever. And through Visage, I ended up joining Ultravox, who quite rightly, as you say, were falling apart. They'd mm. been, on, been on tour in America, came back without the singer and without the guitar player uh, to find that they'd been dropped by the record label. Uh, we had no money and they owed a fortune and all of that. But the moment we went into a rehearsal studio, which we had to stick our hands in our pockets and pull out whatever pennies you had to pay for this, the moment we plugged in and made a noise, it was the most fantastic thing I'd ever heard in my life. This, the power and the atmosphere that, that that band could create was just immense. And was it, Midge, just after joining Ultravox, and this will mean a lot to our Irish audience, that you took something of Busman's Holiday Touring America with Phil and Thin Lizzy, or how did that come about? Well, I, I, I used to go and see Lizzy in the very early days in Glasgow when they were a three-piece, because I, I had heard, I'd read somewhere in one of the music papers that, that Philip Lynott had once been in, for a very short period, uh, Skid Row. Hmm. with Noli Bridgman and and, uh, and Brush Shields and stuff. And I had seen Skid Row with a very young Gary Moore uh, playing. Wow. So I went to see this band, this Thin Lizzy band, uh, as a three-piece, and they were fantastic. I mean, Philip was such a, a charismatic front man with a, a hmm. totally individual voice, and the songs he wrote were just stunning uh, bits of songwriting. So I, I, I kind of, I, I bumped into him when I moved to London to join the Rich Kids. Uh, he, he recognised me and said, <laughs> you're, that, you're that kid from Slick, aren't you? And I said, yeah, well, I know who you are. And we just started hanging out. So I was in the studio, uh, had joined Ultravox, was putting the finishing touches to uh, Fade to Grey uh, in the recording studio. And I got a phone call from Philip's manager saying, He's in Arkansas, you know, opening up for Journey, playing these megadomes. He's going to call you. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> so he called up and said, look, Gary's not in the band anymore. We're down to three piece. We've got another three weeks to go around America. Can you get on a plane tomorrow and come out and finish the tour? And my head was screaming, you're not good enough. But my heart was saying, Thin Lizzy in America, yes, please. <laughs> So um, I, I planned on, on learning all the songs. They sent me a big bunch of cassettes. His management sent this bunch of cassettes and a set list and, and a plane ticket. 
And I planned, and it literally was the next morning. There was a car coming to get me, like, in four hours' time. <laughs> so I packed my bags, didn't even look at the set list, got my ghetto blast on my headphones, got picked up, taken to the airport. I'm thinking, I'll learn the songs on the way across to America. It's, a, it's an eight-hour flight. They sent me out on Concord. So by the time <laughs> we landed... I'd only gone through like two or three songs. So I spent my first night ever in America, in New Orleans, with Scott Gorham, the other guitar player, learning all the harmony guitar parts for all the Thin Lizzy <laughs> songs. And the next night I was on stage in front of 30,000 people. It was fantastic. That must have been an incredible experience. Oh, it's a Judy Garland, you know, waiting in the wings for the, the lead dancer to break her leg or something, isn't it? It's like, it's, it's what you dream of when you're a kid. You know, and then someday, you know, Thin Lizzy will phone up and say, hey, we need you to come and finish the tour. You couldn't write something like that. It's crazy. No, um, what, there was never the likelihood, was there, Mitch, that you'd stay with Thin Lizzy? Were you always going to return to Ultravox? Always, yeah, Ultravox was my baby, that's it. I'd, mm. I'd come home the moment I walked into that rehearsal studio and I, I was uberly excited about it, you know, the, 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 the scope that it left and, and the uh, experimentation that it gave you was just, you know, you couldn't walk away from that. Um, and I was, never, I was never cut out to be a, a Lizzie guitarist, you know, they've got such a, <laughs> a list of brilliant guitar players. So I was, I was a good stopgap, I think. Stay with us, Midge, or if you don't mind, we're just going to take a short break. Join us in a few moments. Welcome back. I'm here this morning with Midge, your award-winning singer, songwriter and music producer. Now, your first album was Ultravox. It was, of course, Vienna. Oh, went platinum. Extraordinary. And it spawned, of course, a smash hit single of the same name. But tell me first a little about your recording sessions with Ultravox, because they were anything but conventional. Isn't that right? Well, strangely, um, which kind of encapsulates what made that album interesting, was uh, John Taylor from Duran uh, a year mm -hmm. or so back said, look, we were listening to the Vienna album the other day and he said, he said, we were looking for inspiration. They were working with, you know, they were trying to make an a new electronic based record and they were looking for old style inspiration. He said, we can't figure out how you did it because it's got a human feel. And I said, that's because we played everything. Nothing was programmed. Everything was played manually. And when you play manually, like an orchestra, like any band that plays traditional instruments, real instruments, you play slightly out of time with each other and slightly mm -hmm. out of tune with each other. And that's what gives the band the sound. And I said, that's, we didn't program it. If you programmed it, it would be dead and it would be soulless. It was all played by hand. That's so interesting. And, and Vienna, that beautiful single. I'm still amazed. I mean, that was only released, isn't this right? As the third single, almost a full year after the release of the album. I, I think you've said nobody in their right mind would have thought it would be a single. Why not? Because it is so beautiful. Well, you have to understand the parameters that radio had at the time. Uh, we were going through a phase straight off the back of the kind of new wave thing where singles were notoriously short. The singles were two, two and a half minutes long. Mm. And you couldn't get anything on the radio that was more than three minutes. And I remember having the conversations, you know, all of us having the conversations with the record label saying, you know, as we have to put it out as a single. We can see the reaction it gets when you play live, but we need to edit it. And we said, well, what do you want to edit? Do you want to edit the intro? Because that's, that's what sets it up. Do you want to edit the viola solo in the middle? Because that's really important. Or do you want to edit the end, which is the climax of the song? What do you cut out? And we, we just wrangled with them back and forth about not wanting to edit it. And they finally succumbed and said, OK, you know, put it out. It's four minutes long. Put it out and see what happens. And luckily, radio played it. So we were incredibly lucky that it resonated with some people. Was it an amazing surprise then for you all, look, tracking that song's progress on the chart, watching it do so well? Yes, it was weird because I, I was living in a flat in, in London at the time with no telephone. And I used to have to go down to the, the telephone box at the end of the road and stick in my, you know, 50p or whatever it was and phone up the office to find out, you know, how's the record doing today? And of course, as the record was starting to gain traction, uh, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd phone up and they'd say, well, you shipped another 30,000 albums last night. And you say, what? I'm standing here counting out my pennies <laughs> in a 
Melly phone box and you're telling me we're selling all these records. This is crazy because the money doesn't come in. You don't you don't see the royalties for a long, long time. So it was a it was a real double edged sword. You're feeling you're feeling great because you're all of a sudden kind of successful in your your own terms, but you haven't got enough money to get get in the underground <laughs> to go to the rehearsals the next day. So did that album, did that song, did it change the trajectory of your life in terms of your success? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, it changed everything. Uh, and it gave you an amazing amount of self-confidence because something that was so left field had become almost mainstream, but still mm. with a radical element to it. And that's just amazing. Oh, so beautiful. 1984, of course, different project, Band-Aid, Do They Know It's Christmas. How well had you known Bob, Bob Gelder, before that? Who contacted who? And how did you write the song? I'd known Bob uh, since I moved to London to join the Rich Kids and uh, the, the Rats were doing the, the circuit and, uh, and at the time the Rich Kids and the Rats were, were mooted to be the, the two of the new wave bands that would probably break America. Neither was true, of course, <laughs> but at the time we were kind of glued together with this this fantasy. Uh, so when we would come and play in Ireland, uh, Bob would pop along, you know, he wouldn't go too far. He'd, if we were playing, you know, Black Rock, he'd come, <laughs> he'd come out the door and come and see us. Um, and, and we'd see the, the rats playing and whatever. So we knew each other. And of course, everyone knew Bob through Paula, because Paula wrote for, course, yeah. uh, Paula Yates wrote for a Record Mirror, and she was interviewing all the bands. Everyone knew Paula. And we just became friends. And it was, on the, the tube, the, the, the television show, the tube on, in Newcastle, a uh, live music show, it used to be on a Friday late yeah. afternoon. Uh, Paula used to co-host that. And, uh, and I was chatting to Paula, who was hugely pregnant, when the phone rang, the old Bakelite phone. And it was Bob talking to Paula. And I heard him saying, who's there? <laughs> and she said, oh, it's Midge, we're just having a chat. He said, that, that, get, put them on, stick them on. <laughs> so. Um, so he told me about what he'd just seen on television, which was the Michael Burke footage, the first footage that was shown about the famine in Ethiopia. And uh, he said, look, the rats aren't in a position to do anything. I want to do something. Will you help? And I hadn't seen the footage at this point. I, and of course, you just say yes. Nobody says no to Bob. <laughs> and we met up a couple of days later, at which point of, we'd all seen the footage, you know, we were inundated with it. It was big news. And we talked for a couple of hours about what we might be able to do to raise some money to try and generate some income to alleviate some of the misery there and finally came to the, the, the ultimate conclusion that we're not good at anything <laughs> other than maybe writing a song. So we thought if we wrote a Christmas song and got a Christmas number one by Hooker by Crook, uh, the charts freeze so you can generate twice as much money from the same record if you get Christmas number one because the charts freeze over Christmas, over New Year, and that was at a time when, you know, Auntie Mary would buy Wee Jimmy a, 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 mm. a, whatever's number one for Christmas. So you could sell a lot of records. So it was quite cold and calculated. And I went home from that meeting and sat with a sat with a little toy keyboard and came up with a da 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 wow. thing. Sent it to Bob who hated it and then he <laughs> came over to mine the next day with a with a half baked song that I it transpires that the Boomtown Rats was thought it was so bad they had turned it down. <laughs> <laughs> and and that was the bones of Christmas time, no, you'd be afraid, you know. And uh, and I had just built a studio, so I, I started knocking this thing together and played all the instruments on it while Bob bludgeoned all our mates to come along and add their strength and their fan base, which was incredibly important uh, to the project. Uh, and lo and behold, we ended up with this this record. And it's extraordinary. I mean, do you remember much, Midge, from that day? I think it was November the 25th, 1984. Everyone from Wham, Culture Club, Spandau Ballet, you 2 all in this studio in Notting Hill recording this song you and Bob had written. Do you remember much about that day? I remember, I remember the most of it. I mean, I, my, my memories all emanate from the mixing desk because I seem to have been glued to it for the entire uh, process. Um, yes, it, it was incredibly good-hearted, uh, good-willed. Uh, a lot of artists that probably wouldn't have been seen in the same room were in there chatting away with each other. <laughs> Uh, odd combinations like, you know, Banana Rama having a right good chat with Bono. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was good hearted and it was good natured because uh, everyone knew why they were there. So 
you know, it was great. There was there was nothing there. Uh, if it's, you wanted a sandwich, you had to go to the little shop round the corner and find it open. There were no drinks, there was no catering, there was nothing. You know, you came there, you did your job. And I remember distinctly at the end of the day, once we'd got all the vocals and things done, all the choral vocals and, and everyone's solo parts, and I had to mix the record because it had to be in the pressing plants by eight o'clock the next morning. Because remember, it was vinyl. Yeah. So the vinyl took a long time to press up and it had to be put inside sleeves manually and it had to be put in a truck and then sent out to the retailers. And, uh, and it all had to be done by that time the next morning. And I remember the, the creme de la creme of the UK and, and Irish music industry all sitting there and I had to throw them out and, and they didn't want to leave because they were having a good time and they had nowhere to go. I'm thinking, you're all multi-millionaires, get, get out and go and enjoy yourselves, we're going to be stuck here all night. So we had to kick them out and then carry on trying to mix the record because it had to be complete. And the, the big memory for me was at the end of the entire process, Bob took a cassette and jumped in a taxi and went to Radio 1. And I jumped in my car to drive home and I had the radio on. And as I'm driving home, very, very tired and very emotional, I hear Bob enter the studio at Radio 1. And they, they talk about it and then they, they put the cassette on, which they never ever did. Nobody ever played a cassette on the radio, on national radio. Mm -hmm. And the moment it was finished, they rewound it and they played it again. And I thought, I thought that something, something magnificent's going on here. Something massive is happening. And did that make you at that moment? You're obviously exhausted mixing it. You had to do it in 24 hours. Did that make you very emotional, or just very proud, or a mixture of both at that moment, listening to the song? I think there was, I think it was a lump in my throat and a tear in my eye because mm -hmm. you know I just spent all night listening to this thing. But there's always an emotional moment when you hear what you've worked on getting played on the radio for the first time. But to hear it on the radio twice back to back from a cassette on national radio because normally they don't play it unless it's got a barcode or a, or a code number or whatever was just amazing so you know i kind of went home slept for a few hours and then you know all hell broke loose it was national news it was on the all the you know the, the national tabloids and the, the broadsheets and and it was bouncing all around the world that a bunch of musicians from a, a fairly well-known uh, to be selfish industry had done something for someone else and that was just amazing and it's extraordinary and it, it can never be taken away from any of you particularly you and bob actually is it frustrating though midge that despite all of your efforts all you put together in band-aid so many parts of the world i suppose even today there are still so many people starving Oh yeah, uh, well hence, hence the term band-aid, it's a plaster, it uh, was never meant to, to be a major surgery. Um, we hoped to earn you know, £100,000, but then the industry gave up all their royalties and the retailers gave up theirs and everyone gave up their slice of the pie and it turned into the seven or eight million pounds that, that it was at the time. So yeah, it's frustrating to see it, but we know you know, we weren't too naive to think that, you know, yeah, this chunk of money we've made is going to make a massive difference. It made a difference, all right. I mean, you can speak to people today who wouldn't have been around today uh, because someone went out and paid a pound for that record. That's a, a major difference. So you have to think of it in those terms. You can't fix the problem. And of course, going out to Africa afterwards, you know, many years afterwards, you find out that what wasn't being batted about at the time was the, the term global warming. And that was the reason that the, the crops wouldn't grow, uh, they couldn't depend on the rains. So the first time I went out with the initial aid, nobody mentioned global warming. It was never on the mm -hmm. agenda. So it was just, you know, fate. And then, of course, 20 years later, you go back and you think, OK, everyone's talking about global warming and reforestation and creeping deserts and all of that stuff. And you start to understand that this is a, a global planetary problem, not just an African one. And I know, Midge, you consider, I think you said your role as a dad much more important than singing in a band. I think you have four girls, but Band-Aid and what you did there as a father to your daughters, that must be something you feel very proud of because they must be very proud of that, even though they would not even have been born. <laughs> and, they, and they probably wouldn't admit it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I would like to think so. I mean, you know, what can you teach your kids? You know, my parents taught me right from wrong and good from bad. That's about it. And then it's up to you and your path in life that will teach you everything else. So if I've taught them good from bad and I've kind of shown them something, you know, in my background that says I'd stood up and stood up for the right 
reasons and I stood up for the right thing and I raised my voice and I stuck my head above the parapet. That's a, not a bad thing to do. I'm sure they're incredibly proud of it, but it's, it's not the sort of thing. They weren't so proud of it when the schools would ask me to come and sing the song <laughs> at, at the Christmas events. You know, when they were little, they used to sit and cringe and pull yeah. their hoods up More their heads. Yeah. <laughs> but then again, that's a dad's job. Absolutely. But look, as we come to the end, you sound still incredibly young. You look great. You're about to mark your 70th birthday. Will you have a big bash, a big party or not? Actually, on the day, I'm just going to spend it with my family, my daughters, my wife. So that's, that's lovely because we don't get the opportunity to do that often enough. But prior to that, I, my agent last year asked me if I wanted to celebrate this event. And I said, well, we, we have to do it bigger, not do it at all. And we looked at the Royal Albert Hall. And of course, because of lockdown and all the rescheduled touring and stuff, you couldn't get anywhere near the Royal Albert Hall. Mm. Everything was booked up until a month ago when a date popped up the 4th of October, which is, you know, six days before my birthday. And I thought, you know what, we're going to grab that and just celebrate the fact that I'm, I'm still waking up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Doing fantastic songs. Well, look, it's a joy to speak to you, Midge. You're so unspoiled by your success. You're playing at the Forever Young Festival at the beautiful Palmerston House Estate on Sunday, July the 16th. That's next Sunday. And Midge, before we go, we're going to listen to one of the 80s biggest hits, a global smash hit for your Ultravox. It is, of course, Vienna. Thanks so much, Midge, for talking to me this morning. Absolute pleasure. Thank you.